everyone to the June 7th Mono Basin Historical Society meeting and presentation. Um, again, we hope everyone's enjoying these presentations. Uh, Dave Carl works very hard on getting, uh, getting us great speakers every month. And uh, we do record and we put them on our YouTube channel so that if you know anyone that would like to see them later and miss the, uh, miss the meeting, please, uh, please feel free to let them know that they can go to the um, historical site monobasinhistory.org and, um, and hit the video selection and they can get it there. Uh, a couple of quick announcements. I wanted to show folks that um, we, and thank everyone for the donations for the Philicina House repairs. Uh, Dave Carl, uh, Dave Swisher, uh, John Warnicke went out to work on the house and got repairs done. And they went to, um, they had to go over to the BLM fire department and recruited a couple of guys from over there to, um, to take care, to help them put some parts of it up. So I'm just going to show you here real quick. Let's see. And what we got. And let's see. Show from current slide. Okay, so this is what the house looked like before uh, the repairs. And these were the gentlemen out working on it, and they've got the house shored up about as good as we can do it without getting a bunch of professionals in there. Yeah. So, uh, so things were looking a lot better when we're done, and we sure thank you for the donations and the, um, the gentleman that went out and helped. Let's see, what else have we got? Okay, let's see. I'm going to stop sharing for a second here. And we've got our ghost tour coming. We are definitely going to have a ghost at the 17th annual Ghost of the Sagebrush Tour. And I should have kept sharing a screen because, let's see, there we go. So it's read it. The subject this year is Rediscovering Lower Rush Creek. It's the 17th annual Ghosts of the Sagebrush. Uh, it'll be August 27th and 28th. The dinner will be at Mono Inn. Uh, the cost for the dinner is $35. The cost for the tour is $30, which includes lunch. Uh, the tickets uh, can be bought either at the museum or call the museum with a credit card. And we will have something online this week that we can also purchase online. It's not on there right now, but I expect to have it on by the end of the week. So that's our ghost sagebrush tour. Then let's see here. We have um, the art and ice cream is coming up uh, July 17th from uh, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. There is uh, no charge to attend. Uh, and go through the booths and the ice cream uh, will also be by donation only. The other cool thing we have started is a, let me see if I can find it, um, a basket raffle of the month. And this month is schools out. And so this basket Linda has got put together with all sorts of school type things from the museum. She's got some note cards, some books, some t-shirts, uh, calendars, books. She is going to list, uh, have a list of everything that is in there. And we will also have the ability to buy tickets for this online, oh, but we can do them by phone or stopping by the far. museum. Yeah. And they are a um, dollar a piece or six for five dollars. And we're going to have, we'll, we'll pull the winner of the basket next month at our meeting on July 5th. And Linda's going to put together a different themed basket each month. So I believe she said that next month's will be the Mono Basin. And that is it for, oh, for our, um, our, our uh, announcements, 
I do want, we'll talk about next month's um, meeting, but I did want to let everyone know that we're going to try, if the county's uh, going to go for it, to have an in-person and Zoom meeting. So we'll, um, the folks that are out of towners will stay they'll be able to come, but the in-town folks or the folks without computers, they'll be able to start uh, attending the meetings. So that is it for, um, for our announcements. And uh, today's program is presented by our own Rich Foy, and it's Hollywood Comes to the Loop. In the 30s and 40s, many Hollywood celebrities va vacationed in the June Lake Loop. A few stayed to become part of their community, and he's going to give us their stories. And for any of you that don't know Rich, Rich is one of our um, MBHS Board of Trustee members. He makes these Zoom meetings happen, and uh, he's also super knowledgeable in anything about the early decades of the movie industry and we thank him very much so I'm going to turn this over to Rich and if you have any questions comments feel free to put them in the loop or in the chat and uh, we'll get to them at the end all right Rich it's all yours okay thank you so uh, hopefully you can hear me well uh, Robin Chime in if there's if you see a problem because I don't necessarily know what it is that everybody else is seeing. Well, let's start okay, by so talking we... about celebrity. If if a lot of people know what you look like, then you're a celebrity. And the reason they would know what you look like is the media. Go back to the late 1700s, and George Washington, there on the left, was the most famous person in the world. But and if you're an American, you might have a picture of him on your currency in your pocket. But otherwise, maybe a wood block print, or if you lived in Philadelphia or New York, you might might see uh, a portrait of, of uh, Washington. Uh, by the year 1900, it had changed, but not tremendously. We did have photography by then, and there were even uh, magazines devoted to photographs. But on the major media was still the newspaper. And newspapers really didn't like photography. It didn't come out very well, as you can see at the bottom. You can, you can see that they're photographs, but newspapers would generally prefer to have line drawings. If you, so that's how you knew what John L. Sullivan or, or President Roosevelt looked like. Now, all of this was about to change in just a few years later, after 1910, when we had movies. Now, D.W. Griffith thought that he shouldn't have to print the name of his actors, much less advertise who was in his movies. But very quickly, people noticed that if Mary Pickford were in the, a movie and they knew it, the, they would more likely attend. So the concept of Hollywood movie stars was created. In just a couple of years, hundreds of millions of people around the world knew what Clara Bow looked like, knew what Douglas Fairbanks looked like, Gloria Swanson, or Rudolph Valentino. And just right after that became the advent of fan magazines. And they noticed very quickly that the public had an almost insatiable appetite for mundane facts about these movie stars. Why Mary Pickford bobbed her hair would sell this magazine. Well, business people realized that the sensational appetite for what Hollywood uh, movie stars are doing uh, could be used to their advantage. So if they would advertise that movie stars would smoke their cigarettes or drive their cars or stay in their hotels, it would be a good thing. So very early on, the June Lake Lodge, which is now the Heidelberg Inn, started keeping track of the Hollywood stars that would come by. Hollywood uh, discovered the June Lake area in the 30s and 40s, and they did indeed come up uh, here and in the Carson Camp, which is now Silver Lake Cafe, and they started advertising who was showing up. And they print, would print a list, and the Chamber of Commerce would copy that list, and then travel logs would copy that list, and travel log, other travel logs would copy that list, and names seemed to get added along the way until the list looks something like this. So I like we have a president of the United States, we have an, a, an exotic dancer, and we have one of the three stooges. 
So there are a few problems with this list. First of all, uh, how do we know how accurate this is? For example, here Ingrid Bergman uh, had a photo shoot from Life magazine as she went skiing in 1950 on June Mountain. So that's pretty accurate. But uh, how about Joan Crawford? Here she is, and there she's riding in a wagon, and there in the background is Mammoth Lakes area. And one, this is from the Bride War Red, 1938. And there's another scene where June Lake is in the background. She's picnicking in the foreground. Trouble is, these are not exteriors. Uh, she is in a soundstage in Warner's, and what, that is being projected on a rear projection screen behind her. So all this image really means is that she was in Burbank. So was she? In, did she come to June Lake? Maybe, but it's it's hard to know. So. My second problem with this list is there's no context. We don't know if these people supposedly came by for an afternoon, stayed for a week, stayed for a month. But if we decide that we're more interested in those who stayed and bought or built places in the June Loop, that list would then come down to these four names. So my final problem with this list is that these are just kind of names. People use them as though they have meaning. But all of these people's careers are pretty far in the past. And a lot and very few people really know why they're famous and what they did. Well, that's what I'm going to try to cure tonight. So I'm going to give you in the next hour or so a four-part biography of these four individuals who made the June Lake Loop their home, at least in the summer and starting with Wallace Berry. So those of us who grew up in the 50s and 60s in Southern California had KHJ TV, and we, had, we were inundated by old movies, which might explain a lot for me. And this is the Wallace Berry that, that I knew, uh, you know, relatively old. This is, this is from The Champ, which we'll look into a little bit later. Uh, but 30 years earlier, here he was in New York. He was top of his top of his looks is quite a hunk actually uh so let's look at where wallace berry built his house here's silver lake and all four of our individuals built homes here wallace berry on that little island there which many of you probably know here's a picture of it here's a picture of it where it's more obviously on that little island this house was destroyed in an avalanche i think in the 40s but the foundations are still there here he is, I like the placement of the outhouse there. It's fully 12 inches from the lake. Here he is with, I think this is his wife, Rita, but I didn't publish that because I'm not sure. Apparently being married to Wallace Berry was a difficult proposition. Here he is in aviator garb because he would fly into June Lake. One of his good friends, Frank Capra, would fly with him uh, Frank Capra in his autobiography reports clearing brush from a make-do strip on uh, above the June Lake Beach and landing there was like landing in a roller coaster. Uh, taking off was even worse though because here you are at 7,000 feet and that airplane simply didn't have as enough oomph to get off the ground if more than just Wallace Berry, Berry were flying. So they got him in the air and rather daunting uh, fashion, and then Wallace Berry's chauffeur would drive Frank Capra and any of his other friends that were with him down to the Bishop Airport, and he, Frank and uh, Wallace Berry would land there and take off from there, which was a whole lot easier than 9,000 feet in the air. So, excuse me, and oh. Uh, so back to our young Wallace Berry, born 1895 in Missouri. And he was a free spirit from the beginning. He kept running away from home. At 16, he ran away for good and literally joined the circus. And he spent a couple of years in the circus until he got mauled by a big cat. And then he decided he needed another career. His older brother, Noah Berry, was working in New York in theater at that time, and he persuaded young Wallace, or Wally as everybody called him, to come join him. And Wallace Berry had very big presence, and pretty good-looking kid, and apparently a good baritone voice. So he immediately found work on the stage in New York. 
And he stayed there for a few years. And then when this thing called the movie showed up, he decided to throw his hat in the ring. And he moved to Chicago, where he joined SNA, which is a Chicago-based studio. Uh, Charlie Chaplin uh, created a number of his films at SNA. And Wallace Berry made a number of movies, including starring in a couple of one-reelers called where he portrayed Sweetie, which is a rather interesting drag comedian. Well, he got enough notoriety that he then moved uh, west to Hollywood with the rest of the film industry, and he joined Max Sin Studios, where he worked with Keaton and everybody else there. And besides having a comedic bent, he also, with his large presence, was cast as the bad guy. And notice his expression here is pretty much the same as the expression here, where he's staring at a Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle. This is an outtake from The Roundup, which is the first movie ever shot, first feature-length movie ever shot in Owens Valley. And Wally Berry, with his presence, got all sorts of uh, roles open to him. This is from perhaps the most popular of all silent films, Douglas Fairbanks' Robin Hood. And there's Wallace Berry playing Richard the Lionheart. He comes home from the Crusades to find that his brother John has usurped his throne, impeded only by the Earl of Huntingdon, also known as Robin Hood. And Richard the Lionheart comes home, throws John out of the castle, banishes him from the kingdom, and then goes to thank his friend. And this joke only works because of Wallace Berry's presence. <laughs> so, Wally then had a long career in the silent films, usually as a second banana. Here he's uh, in a not featured role, but he would be second or third listed uh, with some of the biggest names in silent cinema. Uh, sometimes when he did have the right characteristics, he would get the lead role. He, he played Casey at the bat. He was there on the left as, K, as the title character. And he made a lot of comedies, including this one with his friend Raymond Hatton, who we'll, we'll be talking about in just a minute or so. And sometimes he got the title role. Well, at the turn of the era, as silence suddenly became talking pictures, Wallace Berry found himself in an interesting position because he had been trained as an actor on stage in New York. This movie is a very early sound film, and it's interesting in that the starring role is John, there he is, John Gilbert, and if you read any history about the change to sound pictures, they'll talk about how most of the silent stars did not make it into talking pictures, usually because of some uh, impediment. Norma Talmadge had a deep Brooklyn accent, apparently. Well, John Gilbert is was singled out because he was very popular in silence, but the legend is that he had a high tenor voice that simply didn't go with his He-Man image. So he did not survive the, the change to talking pictures. Whereas Wallace Berry, who was second uh, billed in, in this movie, not only survived, but he thrived. And suddenly he was top billing. At, and he joined Metro-Golden-Mare, Met, MGM, and his top billing above Clark Gable. And by 1931, he made his, not really a breakthrough picture, because by this time he'd been in several hundred movies, uh, but he won an Academy Award for The Champ, and this is what I remember, or he is with the fourth Best Actor Academy Award ever presented. And this is what I remember, this guy right here, from KHJ's watching it in 1958 in Los Angeles. So let's let's watch a scene from this. Damn! 
doggone if I didn't forget that. So Wally Berry was a hot property in the 30s. Here he is with Marie Dressler, and they made uh, several insanely popular films, Men and Bill, uh, Tugboat Annie series, uh, these two very curious individuals. He got the title role in Pancho Villa. And uh, this is the other movie I remember from my youth. He was make the definitive Treasure Island. And probably this is why we think pirates look like this, because Wallace Berry will look like this in 1933. So I'm going to pr play another clip from the... You said you'd made a treaty. Well, treaties are only good until you find a chance to break them, matey. That isn't very honorable. Mm, it's smart, Jim. You see what being honorable done for me? I had to show them the map, didn't I? Why were you keeping it from them? Mm, just too many of them to share the treasure with. I just trying to figure a way to get rid of about half of them. Oh, I see. More murder. Oh, no, not murder. Tactics. So Wallace Berry could make murder seem endearing somehow. But he didn't only play those those roles, he also played sophisticated roles. He was in the Grand Hotel with half of the stars at Metro Golden Mayor. And he played a German industrialist married to Joan Crawford. So Wallace Berry in the 30s was perhaps the highest paid actor in Hollywood. His Metro Goldwyn Mayor contract stipulated that he be paid one dollar more than the next highest paid contract actor. And in the middle of the 30s, MGM released their biggest stars. There's Wallace Berry, Gene Harlow, and Clark Gable. So Wallace Berry was the big deal. Secondly, Wallace Berry's good friend played with him in the Senate Studios is Raymond Hatton. Now Raymond Hatton lived in this cabin on Silver Lake, but I don't know where it is. I've tried to find it by matching the roof line from Google Earth. Apparently I'm gonna to have to get in my kayak with a picture in front of me and try to locate this, or perhaps it burned down. I even know what the inside of it looked like, but if anybody knows where that cabin is, I'd love, love to find out. So Raymond Hatton has an even longer career than Wallace Berry. Wallace Berry is in maybe 250 movies. Raymond Hatton was in over 400. And he's well known as a journeyman actor or character actor. Here he is in 1913 in Barney Oldfield's Race for a Life. And of course, we're, we're chaining a damsel in distress to the railroad track. And he was in innumerable B-Westerns in the 30s. Here he is with John Wayne. He is in a number of movies with Wayne, including... Oh, this isn't what I thought it was. And he did a lot of, uh, of comedies. Here he is with his friend Wallace Berry. Uh, in the 30s, he was one of the three misquiteers with John Wayne and Ray Car uh, Corrigan. And he was through, billed here in a number of three misquiteers movies. He seemed to show up a lot as the wacky sidekick, uh, which does... So I need an explanation for... Roy Rogers already had a wacky sidekick in Gabby Hayes, so he was the wacky sidekick to the wacky sidekick, apparently. But he continued on and even into the television era, and in the 50s starred in a, a number of classic films, including Invasion of the Saucerman. Um, he, he's not inside this. I just like this picture. So anyway, the reason people in this group ought to know about Raymond Hatton is that he was in Hell's Heroes. Hell's Heroes is the movie that was shot in Bodie in 1929 before the fire. And it's actually quite a good movie. I've shown it several times and will probably show it more for the uh, historical society. And it's significant in a number of ways besides showing Bodie exteriors, interiors, and even the citizenry of Bodie were put to service as extras. The, this was one of Willie Wyler's, the director, his big breaks. It was Universal Studios' first location sound movie. This was the third 
of the five times that Hollywood made a film version of Peter Kine's story of the three godfathers. It's about three bad men who rob a bank and kill a cashier and race into the desert where they meet a woman dying in childbirth. But before she dies, she makes them promise to be her newborn's godfathers and to bring them back to the town where, unbeknownst to her, they had just shot her husband. So, Mira, He's the one in the middle. Whoa! You better be practicing that funeral march. <laughs> I wonder how they knowed we was coming. Looks just about your size, Bill. <laughs> You hold him. <clears throat> now, you know, you read from the Bible. And then you take and pour some water on his head. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. What a kiss. Use sand. Sand? You can't use sand. It ain't regular. If so, they use it at funerals. I see him. Oh. I hereby name you after your three godfathers. Strong for that in his face. Here. William. Robert. Thomas. Junior. Buried with him in baptism, I hereby baptize you the party of the first part whereunto the... <laughs> you know, I just don't seem to recollect the whole shebang, little fella. But that'll carry you just as far. Amen. Hey! I've done a heap of ordinary things in my day, but I ain't stealing no water from the little fella. You ain't stealing it all the time or it's coming to you. Uh, sure it is. Go ahead. No use wasting water on me. You two birds hit the trail. We ain't hitting it without you. Uh, no more back talk. No use getting sloppy about it. I'm bedding down right here. Uh, <laughs> I'd kiss you goodbye, little fella, if it wasn't for them two critters making fun of me. Go ahead, Bob Wire. No. I'd give him the itch. <laughs> so long, partners. Don't let my godson die between two thieves.
Manhattan in Hell's Heroes, 1929. So anybody who knows where this cabin was, let me know. Raymond Hatton, one of the longest careers. He never won an Oscar, never even got top billing, but he was known as a fine journeyman actor who could do sophisticated roles, could do the jilted husband, could do comedy, and could do westerns. So our next celebrant here is Walter Lance. And of course, we know Walter Lance, who used to live here, because of... Yes, who? So Walter Lance, born in 1899 in New York, came west, and he also was at Max Sennett Studios. All of them were at Max Sennett at one time. And he did, he created gags, and he did set design. But Walter only wanted to be an animator, you know? Just a kid who wanted to draw stuff. He wanted to be the next Max Fleischer or Walt, or, um, Walt Disney. And he created a number of characters that had small success, uh, including there on his left hand was Oswald Rabbit. He made several cartoons with Oswald. But Oswald obviously was just too close to Mickey Mouse. So he was casting about trying to come up with another character. And he was on his honeymoon with Grace here. That's his wife of 50-some years. And apparently a pileated woodpecker kept them awake. And this supposedly happened here in June Lake. So Woody Woodpecker was based upon that bird that kept them awake. Um, initially, Woody was voiced by Mel Blanc, who seemed to do voices for just about every animated character you can think of. Mel was put under contract to Warner Studios for Bugs Bunny et al. Uh, so Walter had to find somebody else to voice Woody Woodpecker. His wife, Grace, said, oh, I can do that. But apparently Walter thought she was kidding or something. So she submitted an anonymous tape and got selected out of all the other people. And who you just heard at the very beginning of this bit but that was her voice as Woody's, and she, from 1950 on, was the voice of Woody Woodpecker. Made Woody Woodpecker cartoons were over 200 in. So what you just heard was the Woody Woodpecker song that was singing singer Gloria Wood with Kay Kaiser's orchestra in 1948, and that was the only song from any animated short ever nominated for a Best Song Academy Award in 1948. It didn't win, but uh, Walter did win a special Oscar for animation a little bit later. Walter and Grace were very generous to the community, and they supported the library and donated a couple of paintings, including this, which hangs in the library, as does this in the June Lake Library. And up in Levining, they generously donated to establish the Little League Field up there. So that was Walter and Grace Lance, who really put themselves out into the community. So finally, our the fourth of our people, and certainly not the least, is Frank and Lou Capra's house there on the right. And here it is. Now, Frank Capra in the 30s was one of the most important directors in Hollywood. Yeah! Hello, Bedford Ford! Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas, George! Merry Christmas, movie house! Merry Christmas, Emporium! Merry Christmas, you wonderful old building and loan! <laughs> so, Frank Capra, that's probably why you know Frank Capra. You might even watch It's a Wonderful Life yearly. But Frank Capra was not born in the United States. He was born in 1897 in Sicily to a dirt-poor family. They immigrated when he was six. 
coming across in steerage. And one of Frank's earliest memories in, in Ellis Island here was realizing that nobody in his family knew how to read or write. Well, that made quite an impression, and he decided that it would end with him. And he valued education throughout his entire life. He worked very hard at school and out in jobs and got himself enrolled in Caltech in 1915, where he earned a bachelor's in chemistry. He put himself through Caltech, earning or working multiple jobs all along. And even though he had no less than two jobs at any one time, look at all the things he was involved in during that time. Here he is in the Gnome Club, which apparently was a debating society. In the front row, far left, that's young Frank. Now, when he got out of Caltech in 1918, World War One was still going on, and he was in ROTC, so he was immediately enlisted as a second lieutenant. He assumed that he would be sent to the front in, in Europe, but instead the Army sent him to San Francisco, where he taught mathematics to artillery officers. He really knew the value of a Caltech grad. Well, he never did get over there, but he did use his army career to facilitate his, his naturalization. Here is naturalization papers from 1920, where he officially changed his name from Francesco to Frank Russell Capra. He, Frank was having trouble finding work with his chemistry degree. So, but he had nothing if not uh, a lot of bravado. And he went to, in San Francisco, he went to a newly opened film studio up there and he introduced himself according to his autobiography. He said, hi, I'm Frank Capra and I'm up from Hollywood. And I was wondering if you'd like some help. So he, he talked his way into Montague Studios and he's very technical. So he quickly learned the ins and outs and was even allowed to do some directing and he uh, this Montague Studios mostly did industrial films training films sales films but they did a, a few uh, fictional films including Fulta Fisher's Boarding House which he directed in 1921 well after spending a couple years in San Francisco's time to come home to Los Angeles and he came down to Max Senate Studios where he said hi I'm Frank Capra, I'm the director of Fulton Fisher's Boarding House. Do you have work for me? So they put him work first writing gags alongside Walter Lance there for these guys and gags for these guys. There's Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle again on the far right. And eventually he was allowed to not only write gags and write, write scenarios, but direct uh, Harry Langdon features. And he got direction for from Senate for movies that were released through First National and he did did well he continued to get bigger and bigger responsibilities such that he eventually decided to go over to Columbia Pictures which was that at that time was one of the poverty row houses in Hollywood and he'd say hi I'm from Max Senate Studios I direct films over there and he convinced um, Harry Cohn also known as the most despised man in Hollywood he convinced ha uh, Harry Cohn to not only give an opportunity to, to direct a movie but to give Frank Capra complete creative control producer cast control and he made good he's Frank Capra said what do you have to lose and and Harry Cohn decided that was probably true, so he took a gamble on him. And this particular film, Younger Generation, was the first sound film uh, from Columbia Pictures. Frank, being very technical, caught on to the how to make sound movies very quickly. And now for the next 10 years, he had hit after hit for Harry Cohn. And Columbia Pictures changed from a... Poverty Row producer to one of the major producers in Hollywood. Movie after movie, hit after hit. And by 1933, Frank Capra had such a name that his picture on this movie poster is larger than any of the stars. So he had a real bankable name. Lady for a Day was a 
was also his first nomination for Best Director for Academy Award. He didn't win, but in the next year he did for It Happened One Night. He was allowed to borrow this troublemaking actor from Metro named Clark Gable, and he made one of the classic films of all time, a remarkably romantic film that was the first movie ever to win all five of the major Academy Awards, Picture, Best Director, both of which went to Frank Capra, Best Actor, Best Actress, and Best Writer. And you've probably seen a few outtakes from that, perhaps including the, the scene that I'm going to show now. And you're an expert, I suppose. Expert? I'm going to write a book about it. Call it The Hitchhiker's Hail. <laughs> Do you mind if I try? You. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're such a smart Alec. Nobody knows anything but you. I'll stop a car and I won't use my thumb. And Alan Hale Sr. stops and picks them up. So the feat of winning the big five Oscars was not duplicated for another 45 years. A wildly romantic film. So Frank Capra won two Oscars for You Can't Take It With You. Best Picture and Best Director again. And throughout the next 10 years, he had hit after hit. Here's Harry Cohn smiling because of the Oscar that Frank won. And his films were described by the reviewers as Capricorn, as in corny, because the boy always won the girl. It always, everything always turned out good in the end. It always centered on the underdog, the average man who somehow rises above it all to succeed in the end. In 1939, he made his love letter to his adopted country. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. I'm going, this is going to be the longest of the clips I'm going to play tonight. I'm going to play the end of Mr. Smith, where you can see how emotional the Frank Cap Senator Smith has now talked for 23 hours and 16 minutes. It is the most unusual and spectacular thing in the Senate annals. One lone and simple American holding the greatest floor in the land. Take a look at this country through her eyes if you really want to see something. And you won't just see scenery. You'll see the whole parade of what man's carved out for himself after centuries of fighting. Stop, Jeff, stop! <laughs> You know that rule, Mr. Payne. And I loved you for it just as my father did. And you know that you fight for the lost causes harder than for any others. Well, I'm not licked. And I'm going to stay right here and fight for this lost cause. Even if this room gets filled with lies like these. Tell me, not him. When he carries a fall, it's a crime against the people who sent me here, and I committed it. Every word that boy said is the truth. Every word about Taylor and me and Graft and the rotten political corruption of my state. Every word of it is true. I'm not fit for office. I'm not fit for any place of honor or trust. Oh, it's for me. So World War II suddenly breaks out, and right after bombing of Pearl Harbor, Frank Capra re-enlists. He's given an assignment to report to the Pentagon, where he works directly for Chief of Staff George Marshall, who asks him to create a series of films to explain to the new recruits what the war is about, why we fight. This was Frank Capra's sixth Academy Award, three for directing, two for best picture, and one special for the series explaining what the war was all about. And he was given almost no resources to do it, so he wasn't sure how to proceed. So he started by looking at German propaganda, specifically Leni Riefenstahl's Triumph of the Will movie, and it scared him to death. So he decided that took him a day to decide this, that he could use their propaganda and turn it back into them because it would show just what the Germans had in store for the world. And he used some clever animation provided by the Walt Disney Company to show what the Axis had in store for all of us. 
And for that, he got the Distinguished Service Medal, which is the Army's highest non-combat award. There's George Marshall pinning it on him. Now, this period, which is very interesting, Hollywood sent almost 28,000 professionals joined the fight against the Axis. And there is a recent Netflix uh, three-part documentary that is exceedingly well done, talking about five directors who inter interrupted their careers in the prime of their careers and went off to join the war, war effort. There's Frank Capra on the left, Willie Wyler down at the bottom, John Ford, George Stevens, and John Houston. Uh, highly recommended. Well, the war ended, and he, Frank Capra came back, and he picked up making movies where everything ends all right at the end, including this thing that we watch uh, every Christmas. This Wonderful Life was Frank Capra's favorite film, and typical, it celebrates an average man, George Bailey, when things go wrong, but somehow it all works out in the end. And he continued to make movies into the 50s, but he was kind of old-fashioned by then. The movies were turning dark. The film noir was in. The, uh, his brand of optimism was looked down upon. And the studio system was com coming apart. And cast members suddenly started, the stars suddenly started to have a lot of creative say as to what would go on. So his concept of one man, one film, suddenly just didn't work out anymore. 1960, 1961, Pockets Full of Miracles. This was his final Hollywood film. He retired at 63. A couple years before this, though, he did some television that you might remember. The Bell System decided they wanted to make a science series explaining some aspects of science. And four of the seven, ser seven films were made by Frank Capra, including something that I saw projected in my fourth grade classroom, in my fifth grade classroom, in my sixth grade classroom. They always seemed to drag out Hemo the Magnificent, which would talk about how the circulatory system works in one's body. Once again, Walt Disney Animation. So Frank Capra hung up his director's jod purs or whatever you have, and he retired. He went on a lecture circuit. He taught some, and he wrote his autobiography, The Name Above the Title, and which is exceedingly well received. This is one of the must-reads for any student of classic Hollywood. He did some more writing that nobody knew about, though. He wrote a couple of novels, and he put them in a drawer, including this one, which was published three years ago, Cry Wilderness. We'll return to this in a moment. Also want to return to The Lost Horizon, which we made in 1937 from James Hilton's book about a, a mythical mountain enclave where people didn't seem to get old and nobody suffered from want. Let's look at a little bit of it. Welcome to Shangri-La. You see, we are sheltered by mountains on every side. The strange phenomena for which we are very grateful. I show this because it illustrates something that Frank Capra would return to now and then. A sense of place, whether the place was Washington, D.C., or Bedford Falls, or Shangri-La. Sometimes the locale was as important as any character in his movie. Here's the end of Lost Horizon. And that gentleman was the last that any known human being saw of Robert Conway. By Joe, that's what, what I call fortitude. Think of it. <laughs> Tell me something, Gainsford. What do you think of his talk about Shangri-La? Do you believe it? Yes. Yes, I believe it. I believe it because I want to believe it. Gentlemen, I give you a toast. Here's my hope that Robert Conway will find his Shangri-La. 
Here's my hope that we all find our Shangri-La. So, Frank took up writing when he could no longer direct movies. And Crying Wilderness is an interesting novel in that it takes place here in the Eastern Sierra. He and his wife Lou are characters in Cry Wilderness. And he, in this book, actually talks about his mountain home. So you can read along with me here. Where's Silver Lake? It's in Mono County, California, nestled in the Eastern High Sierras. Switzerland can't even hold a yodel to it. It's a jewel of sparkling water set deep in a circle of towering tree green peaks and capped with snow white diamonds. When sun and ripple combine their magic, the lake is a sea of simmering silver, silver. But when in the depths of its stillness it reflects the cobalt of the sky, the passing white clouds stop, narcissus-like, to primp and admire themselves, this most exquisite of mirrors. Frank Capra talking about his mountain home. So that's it. Four Hollywood types who probably could have lived anywhere, but they chose to put down roots and live here as our neighbors in the Eastern Sierra. So thanks for your time. Thank you so much. That was really awesome, Rich. We do have uh, some chats going on. Do you want to look at those? Sure. Or maybe you, you could read it. It sounds more interactive there. There's or, or they could mute themselves, unmute themselves. Oh, Robin, you are, you're, you're muted. Yeah. There, I'm unmuted now. Okay. So let's see. So when you were um, looking for the, the cabin that belongs to Ooh. which one of the actors? Raymond Hatton. Uh, Raymond Hatton. Pam Rake said uh, it kind of looks like Ron Dunn's cabin. No, and no. then Suzanne said, no, it's next door. It's the David's cabin, according to our Silver Lake history material. Oh, excellent. Do we, yes. do we, have, a, do, so do you we have, have an address of that? That, would, <laughs> that will solve a mystery. So Maybe Suzanne could uh, unmute herself and give you some information. Um, yeah, it's on the, it's on the loop. It's just, uh, right next door. Um, I don't have a cabin number, but I think I saw Jill Stark someplace here. Maybe Jill could help. And, <laughs> and it's, uh, but, uh, uh, anyway, it's right there. There's, there she is. And it's, uh, yeah, Jill, you want to help me with that? It is the David's cabin and it will have a number which will be in the 800s, but it's also cabin number 16. So the David's cabin. Okay. Yeah. And it's written, the, the name is there, David. And she would love to have you and show you around. Oh, thank you so much. The living room is still the same. <laughs> yeah, the living room's the same. Is that but right? there's been additions to the cabin. Oh, that's great. I was afraid I was Robin going to Robin can give you my email okay. and everything if you want. Please do. Please do. Okay. We'll, we'll do that, Jill. Thank you. You're welcome. And then Barbara, Barbara says there's an autographed Woody Woodpecker drawing hanging in the break room at the June Lake Fire Station. <laughs> I didn't think to talk to Barbara Richter. I should have known better. Yes. <laughs> Hi, Barbara. <laughs> And uh, Christine Ziegler says it's an awesome presentation, so entertaining. She learned a lot. Uh, thank you, Rich. I can't see, let's see, Eastern Sierra. I can't see the whole name there, but it's fantastic. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Excellent, Rich. Thank you. Uh, fantastic presentation. I always love your talks. Uh, Barbara Richter says it's a Fantastic presentation, Rich. She learned so much. We all did. This was really a great presentation, Rich. Thank you. Well, those, those people deserve to be more than just names that we drop. Absolutely. <laughs> let's see. Um, let's see here. They're going by really fast. 
Oh, Dave Carl wants to know what the July meeting program is. And it is Working Dogs of the Eastern Sierra. And Jen Crittenden is going to come and talk to us about that. And uh, Jen, I think, is on. And we are going to try to do a hybrid meeting. So um, with uh, Jen at the community center, so people that are in town that would like to come can come to the community center. And but we will also be doing uh, the Zoom for those that are not in town. And there's a book involved there. Yes. yes, yes, there is. And the book is entitled Working Dogs of the Sierra. We're really looking forward to this coming from the veterinarian family. So it's going to be a, a really <laughs> a fun one, I'm sure. Let's see. Um, we've got uh, Suzanne Schulten said that um, the Boulder Lodge has a Lance oil painting. I have several apparently to go looking for. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. And uh, Dewey Livingston, uh, very enjoyable, enlightening as usual. Rosemary, uh, Rich, you are always so excellent and entertaining. Loved it. <laughs> and I think that was all of them. And it was, it was just super. Thank you so much, Rich. We really appreciate it. Could I quickly ask, Rich, are you related to the foys of the little foys of Tamarack Lodge? Unfortunately, unfortunately, no, right? The seven, Eddie Foy and the seven little foys, we have a silent E on the end of our name. We're, we're all Irish, but we have no idea why the, I, why the E is there on our name, but about, uh, 15% of the Foy's are anointed with an E, but uh, Eddie Foy and his daughter who built Tamarack Lodge, uh, they have a long entertainment history from vaudeville through films, so. Thank but, you. Yeah. But I like the reflected glory though, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, um, I, will pro I will be sending out an email as soon as we know for so sure um, whether we're going to so be now, on um, original well, i thought you said it was so <laughs> we'll send out an email <laughs> as soon as we know if we're going to have the um the meeting in person as well as zoom for next month so stay tuned for that and um oh somebody i just saw one uh, uh lori uh oh my gosh she says, hi, I had cookies with Walter and Gracie when I was little. They're, my grandparents lived a few doors down. They were the Berrymans. Wow. wow. <laughs> I'm incredibly jealous. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Did you get any cookie recipes, Lori? <laughs> Um, no, no recipes, but I got a lot of souvenirs and I actually have an oil painting in my house. Oh, that's my, awesome. Because my great uncle Marshall Berryman did all the rock work around Silver Lake, all the walkways and the, a lot of the dock work and he was really good friends with the family. So oh my God. I have an oil one painting of these that was passed. <laughs> no, Absolutely. thank you. You did a great job. But yeah, there's there's a lot a lot of beautiful history there. Wow, thank you. All righty. Well, thank you all again very much, and everyone have a wonderful evening, a wonderful month. We'll see you next month, and it is July fifth that uh, that we'll be meeting, and hopefully we'll be able to do it in the visitor in the community center as well as on Zoom. Good night, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you again, Rich. Bye-bye.